Bren uh, was one of the casualties of NIAC, as, as I've discussed earlier. Uh, when NIAC canceled, uh, he was no longer able to make the trip here to Tucson. Uh, we had been looking forward to having him here for an in-person event and for a book signing, uh, but uh, he has graciously agreed to do Zoom. And now that we figured out what time zone Arizona is in, I think we're all uh, get, getting ready to go. So um, I don't think David needs any introduction uh, from this uh, audience. Uh, I first met David in 1984 um, uh, when he had just written The Looms of Thessaly, which you may not even remember, uh, but that was an awesome story, which uh, I, I enjoyed greatly. Uh, David has uh, uh, worked for a California Space Agency. David has uh, uh, taught. He has, he has uh, written uh, many books, including Nebula and Hugo winners. He's written nonfiction. Uh, he's uh, one of our leading thinkers on uh, you know, what all this technology means to us. So uh, we're, we're really lucky to have him. Um, and as you can tell, I did not prepare an introduction for this bio. Uh, so with that, uh, David, if you can see our room, we've got you and slides on the screen. Uh, and with that, David, if you're ready to go, um, hit it. You're in charge. Uh, I, I am. And thank you, Steve. And thank you for your patience, you all. I had a little bit of a frantic thing when I realized that mountain time is the same as Pacific time during daylight savings. So... <laughs> But in any event, it's, it's good to see a nice, healthy audience out there. And I urge you all to stay healthy. Um, it, oh, although I often say about Kevin Costner's movie of my book, The Postman, that it's visually and musically one of the most beautiful films ever shot. Um, and it's big hearted. It was faithful to the heart of my book, but uh, scooped out and threw away all the brains of my book. But you know, gorgeous, big hearted and dumb is not really that bad. Um, it, it is, it, it's, it's what my wife married. Ha 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 ha. Come on, you guys, you have to laugh louder than that or I won't hear you. Okay, so let's get on with this. Uh, opportunities, dangers and destiny in the solar system and beyond. Let's go ahead and see what uh, nonsense I came up with. Um, all right, so I, I, you know, I have qualifications to talk about this uh, science. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm still an astrophysicist, though. That's more the tail of the, um, the, of the dog now. Uh, I just finished a week of um, NIAC's um, symposium. It's wonderful. It's on live stream. You could watch it at your own leisure. These are the cutting edge, just short of science fiction um, programs that are. Um, uh, funded by uh, NASA's uh, most visionary little outfit. I have inventions, designs, and patents. And if you press forward, I believe there are, there are images for this, for this screen. Yeah, so, you know, heart of the comet informed, there's NIAC. So we're gonna have to click through some of these. Here are some of my books. My first nonfiction book, The Transparent Society was about um, uh, privacy and secrecy and alas, has not been made obsolete. My most recent one, uh, Vivid Tomorrows, is about how Hollywood science fiction has probably saved Western civilization. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so usually when you see just text, you might click a second time because there's probably animate. No, I guess we have to go back. So there are two parts. Uh, we'll talk about dangers and opportunities in space and becoming a civilization that's able and worthy to go. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna to have to click through this. This is a slide that's key for when I talk to uh, the CIA and other government agencies, because it, it puts in a nutshell on one slide, um, the fundamental issues that we face. Uh, first off, there's the possibility that we might repeat failure modes of the past. So go ahead and click a couple of times. Uh, Collapse by Jared Diamond explores the concept of repeating mistakes that toppled past civilizations. Um, Toynbee talked about it earlier. The one thing we do know is that there are no so-called cycles of history. That is a, a cult belief that infects uh, even a lot of Americans and it does not exist. It's easily disproved. What there are is some attractor states, including ecological suicide and uh, feudalism. 
Uh, and these have caused uh, real problems in the past. Um, and then next, we have future calamities, um, info, um, uh, artificial intelligence, augment, human augmentation, the Anthropocene, deadly innovations like bio, nano, cyber, a lot of them in sci-fi, and another danger called renunciation, where um, we're seeing in about a quarter of our fellow citizens a nostalgia rush that makes them think that the past was better. And that could kill us all because the path to getting past our problems is not in the past. Is not in the past. And rigid overdependence on fragile systems. I've been pushing that a lot because I have some papers about some of the things we could have been doing the last 30 years to uh, reduce um, our rigidity and our fragility and improve our resilience. But the two key book end concepts that you and this audience are deeply familiar with are one is the singularity, the notion that progress may take us, scientific progress may take us um, beyond uh, our ability to reckon. And in some possible scenarios, our ability to survive. And the other is the Fermi paradox. And if you, these two concepts bookend our fears. So if this slide hasn't depressed you yet, I'll try again later. But there's plenty of reason to believe that this, um, this slide uh, is one that might make you feel a bit daunted on our prospects. But then again, you guys are trying to find ways past this. Next slide. Okay, the dream survives. You know, Willie Lay and these notions, uh, some of the NIAC projects are eerily similar to some of this stuff. Uh, finding these uh, lava tubes, for example, on the moon. If we find uh, a NIAC grant is going to try to explore, do the very preliminary of exploring these lava tubes. Um, but if we find one that's close to the South Polar ice, um, then that could be the most valuable spot on the moon. Next slide. So are we entering a new barnstorming era? Uh, back in the 1920s, after World War I caused a huge acceleration in the progress in air flight, suddenly the rich and then the average people started um, getting access to air travel and interestingly enough, exactly 100 years later, we're seeing signs of something similar. And I don't have this on this slide, but I'm on record predicting that 2022 will be the year that the rich get uh, flying cars. Um, next, uh, so we're seeing this barnstorming era um, uh, moving ahead. Next. And uh, there's a scene from my, um, the beautiful trailer to my uh, novel, Existence. You look it up, uh, David Brin trailer, Existence, and um, you'll get a three minute video trailer and one of um, the most fun you'll have in three minutes with your clothes on. But the, um, one of the early scenes in the book is extrapolating this notion of the rich shooting themselves off into space. Next slide. Okay, so uh, there's alternatives, Elon's starship and its rivals, Bigelow's huge uh, habitat, which uh, may enable us to uh, get a largely commercial um, uh, space station to replace the obsolete ISS, uh, while NASA goes ahead and uses the lessons learned to do the good part of the Artemis mission, which is the Lunar Gateway. Um, many, many years ago, around 1981, I was involved with the California Space Institute in attempts to get NASA to hold on to the space shuttle external tanks in orbit so that in some future era, we might use them. And I have one of my short stories, Tank Farm Dynamo, is a real nerdy story about, uh, about that concept. And amateur zealots taking to the sky. Let's click and see if there are any other images here. Okay, and then as well, science fiction, you know, explores possibilities of war in space. 
uh, Ghost Fleet was read by almost every single military officer in the United States military and in China um, a while back. Um, and Niven and Portel's uh, footfall also was a, was a very good extrapolation of future war that in which space assets are crucial. Next slide, uh, or let's click through. Uh, so Space Force, uh, did you see the uniforms? Uh, Never mind. Uh, let's, let's, and then, of course, woo, Space Force. Let's move on. Okay, so now uh, this chart is actually a decade old, but it showed the number of missions that we have sent to the moon, to Venus, to Mars, to Jupiter, and on past, you can see a couple going past Uranus and Neptune. And um, of course, it's accelerated because we are re-entering the golden age of space probes, and partly thanks to some of the great ideas we've done at NIAC. But take a good look at this chart. Um, there are two regimes in this chart. First of all, I'm going to give you a little factoid that you may not know, and that there are only four gravitational regimes in the solar system. Um, there's... Um, Asteroids, there's, uh, and, and they all have the same very small amount of gravity. And then uh, there's lunar, and it turns out Mercury and bunches of other places have lunar levels of gravity. Then there's Martian gravity, and there are several of those. Um, and then the Earth, it turns out the Earth is not the only one with Earth-like gravity. It turns out that uh, Uranus and Neptune, and by some metrics, if you put the surface in the various places, uh, even Saturn and Jupiter have Earth-like gravity. Um, so the two major points, the, uh, the three destinations for major effort are the moon or Mars or asteroids or the roofed worlds. It turns out that Europe, Europa and then Enceladus, yeah, Arthur C. Clarke knew about Europa. He didn't know about Enceladus, but it turns out there may be as many as 10 ice-roofed liquid water oceans in this solar system. And if this proves out, and it seems likely, then it has something very interesting to imply about the universe. And that is almost every star you see out there probably has a liquid water potential biome near it. And if life is easy to make, we don't know yet, but it seems every year to move in that direction, then the universe is filled with life. You don't need to be in a Goldilocks habitable zone in order for one of these roof worlds to have a liquid water ocean and be a potential abode of life. I mean, you know, Europa and Celadus and Titan are not in, in, in the uh, habitable zone. So we may be a freak of nature, uh, but a freak of nature that enables uh, beings that can make starships. Uh, next slide. Okay, we yearn for Mars, click. Um, Elon means to break it forward and uh, what a guy, what a guy. Um, if we live to see it, it's gonna be largely because of him. Next. And of course, science fiction depicts what um, I don't think even Jeff Bezos with his immortality thing is going to live to see, and that's the possibility of red Mars becoming green Mars becoming blue Mars. But it's an interesting uh, thought. Move on. Okay, we, alas, we've fallen into a zero-sum fight over the immediate goal. And to some extent, we are managing to do both. And that's great. But there's going to come a point in time in which we're going to have to choose, and I think we're making the wrong choice. Now, it's interesting that NIAC has proposals for both of these realms, for exploiting the moon or exploring and finding the water at the lunar poles and for exploiting the resources of asteroids. So, so far, we're trying to do both. And my curmudgeonliness about one of these two is um, going to make some of you throw things at the screen but I urge you to think about it. Think about what I have to say. Um, because yes, 
humanity is going back to the moon, no matter what, for certain reasons. And yes, America should be involved in that. But the notion of American astronauts rushing to plant foots, useless footprints on a poison, dusty, useless plane is offensive to me. It's going to take a, so far, people like Bridenstine and the guys at NASA have managed to protect, protect the important parts of NASA from this awful boondoggle. Next. Okay, so asteroids, we have two big reasons to look at asteroids. One is take a look at all those impacts that we know about. And that was so, as of a few years ago, um, click. And of course, it's the impact problem. Click. The B612 Foundation, I urge you guys to join. It's cheap and they are constantly on the move trying to find the next way to uh, help protect us. As appropriately, NASA and ESA keep taking over things that the B612 tried to do. Well, God bless it. That's, that's a, exactly the right thing. Next. And planetary resources is now defunct, but just at this point, it turns out that some of the same guys are now pouring money into a company called Transastra that has, because of NIAC, real potential for being able to test within just a few years, preliminary methods for getting water out of asteroids. And if it works, then we should leave the water on the lunar poles to future uh, loonies, I mean, future lunar citizens, because they're going to need it more than we will because we can get it from asteroids. Next, um, going back to 1980, Mining the Sky by John Lewis, who was a professor at U of A just down the road from you guys. Last I heard he was still kicking and uh, the real founder. But um, let me just say that the overlap between asteroids and Mars is Phobos. And it could be the most valuable place in the solar system if it turns out to be a carbonaceous chondrite with a lot of volatiles near the surface so we could set up in situ resource utilization and uh, a refueling station on Phobos. If that were the case, and we use the same methods or similar methods on the Martian surface to, re to create fuel depots then, uh, and life support. Then the combination of those two facts would bring forward the notion of a, um, a true back and forth between Earth and Mars um, by decades. Next. Okay, so let's talk about the whole concept of ores. Why do we have ores that can be mined on Earth? Most of the metal sank into the Earth's core before the moon formed from Earth crust. Starting metal poor um, because the, moon's, the, the moon was torn from the Earth's outer crust by a Mars-like object called Thetis, according to the best theory uh, going now. So the molten moon was made from the depleted Earth's crust, and then it melted and its metals sank into its own core. So the only metals at the surface are those bound in tight oxides that were light enough to float on the basalt. And those oxides are very tough to split and refine, as we know, because aluminum oxides, uh, which is called bauxite, is mostly refined next to huge hydroelectric dams that can supply enough power. Now, some of the NIAC um, uh, proposals are how to maybe move ahead and use copious solar power on the moon to go ahead and split off the aluminum, silicon, titanium, and that would be great. And if we succeed at that, it will help to mollify David Brin. But as yet, the only metals available are in tight oxides or um, debris from metal um, meteorites that you might be able to uh, collect by dragging a magnet. On Earth, elements got separated into ores by water processes, uh, sometimes volcanism, meteorite impacts. The moon had no water separation processes and no ore producing volcanism. There's some scattered meteorite 
um, iron. And yes, my, my uh, doctoral advisor, Jim Arnold, was the guy who predicted there'd be ice at, at some polar sites on the moon and even Mercury. But they have very little sunlight and there are two different NIAC grants this year on how to get sunlight down into these uh, craters. So we're working on it, that's great. But all of these things can be done best robotically. Do not raise helium-3 with me if you don't want to be smacked. Um, there is no evidence for anything more than parts per billion. I love the movie Moon, but I think the far more realistic movie about helium-3 is called Iron Sky. If you haven't watched either of those movies, and I really wish be, I could be there because I would have enjoyed the laughter from some of you in the audience, that I was not able to hear. But I recommend from the sublime to the ridiculous to watch both of those movies, Moon and Iron Sky. There are no known customers for Helium-3. And if it happens, we'll be able to do the harvesting robotically. And I'm not saying that America shouldn't go back to the moon. We should go back to the moon robotically and in orbit above the moon where the real benefit is. In contrast, many astronaut asteroids come from either water-rich comets or else a shattered protoplanet, pure refined metal from that planet's core, pure refined metal, easily available from that metal, from that core. And NASA is about to send the mission to Psyche, which we believe is the remnant core of that failed planet. So know where the stuff is, okay? Um, don't just accept lunar resources as a buzzword. There's too much of that going on in our politics already. Next slide. Okay, now let's bear in mind velocity, delta V needed. From Earth's surface to low Earth orbit is eight kilometers per second. You all know that. From Leo to a near Earth asteroid, is just 5.5 kilometers per second. From Leo to lunar surface is 6.3, to the moons of Mars is eight. Now, this does not talk about return, and the return from the asteroid is also a lot better. Next. Okay, so there are near-Earth asteroids, and there are some really great proposals for how to expand our knowledge of these near-Earth asteroids uh, we already know, uh, we already have registered all the planet killers, all the, all the terrible ones, and we're pretty knocking down on most of the city killers. But now we're talking about, you know, in the 20 meter range, the 40 meter range, and, 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 and a Transastra is going to be looking for, and their first mining operations would, would be with five meter size or less. Next slide. Thousands of asteroids are energetically easier to access than the lunar surface. Though when humans are evolved, it's an entirely different matter. Time becomes more crucial than energy. Um, and um, so asteroidal wealth depends on robotics. But when you get right, and then the moon is just a couple days away, so it's, uh, it's better for people in that respect. But lunar also relies on robotics. Next. Okay, so here are the trade-offs. The moon is closer by time, just 2.2 to 5 light seconds for teleoperation. But each person day is lots of money. Asteroids, we're not going to be sending people very soon. But it's energetically fine for robots. Um, Asteroids we know contain trillions, quadrillions even of pre-refined easy return uh, wealth. Um, the resources on the moon are mostly mythological except some polar water that um, are stolen from future lunar colonists. Um, and nothing else is verified. Negligible private investment in the moon. Um, it is not a way station to Mars. Orbit might be a way station to Mars. The, the lunar surface is just, just costs you a lot of energy in, in, as a stopover to go to Mars. Humanity is returning to the moon in any event. 
China, India, Russia, billionaires, they are all eager to go back to the moon for the same reason we went there 50 plus years ago, and that is pride. Um, to go, look, in his book, Artemis, his second novel, uh, Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, racked his brains to find an economic reason to support a Martian uh, settlement, I mean, a, a, a lunar settlement. And he could only come up with one, tourism. And that's what's going to motivate humans to go to, Mar uh, to the moon. Um, and there's no reason, we have no reason of national pride to do it. We've been there. We should say to all the others, welcome to our moon. And we should sell them, rent them, hotel room on the Lunar Gateway Station and rent them landers. But if we get into a race to send astronaut footsteps to the moon, here's what's going to happen. And you will know I said this when it does. It will wind up being so expensive that we'll do what we did with the International Space Station and suddenly declare a victory for humanity that it's going to be an international mission. And that will result in the United States of America handing over all pertinent technologies. It's a trap. The US and Japan should go down there robotically, keep an eye on everybody, do all the cool things we can do robotically. But the US and Japan and ESA should do what no one else can do and no one else can do asteroids. Um, anyway, so um, that's, 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 that's enough for me ranting on this slide. Next slide. Yes, the sweet spot is lunar orbit. It's perfect to st test next stages of human spaceflight. Experiment with robot returned asteroidal matter. That was an original purchase because people won't want you to take asteroidal matter down to Leo or down to the Earth unless it's been properly vetted. Uh, and we could charge wannabes for tourism and landing services, hotel rooms on the on the um, on the gateway and 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 landers landers we're 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 creating landers China will refuse out of pride, but there's an additional reason to do the gateway and that is a secure garage for national security assets, because if we have a place that cannot be destroyed easily, um, then no one will be tempted to destroy all the space assets in Leo and Geo. Uh, next slide. And there's Artemis by Andy Weir. All right, so the crux is the moon's principal attraction for the near future is tourism and symbolism, a national rite of passage or a bar moonsba, so that Chinese and Russians and Indians and others can land there and say, uh, today we are men. Well, that's all right. We were, we were men 52 years ago. All right, next slide. I think you're tired of my rant. Um, so let's move on to some uh, uh, less ranty things. Um, the lurker hypothesis. Ron Bracewell uh, was the first to, uh, that we know of to suggest that there might be von Neumann self-replicating probes sitting in our solar system lurking, refusing to make contact, but watching us. Uh, and there's any number of places they could be. Um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke suggested in his story Sentinel that became 2001 Space Odyssey that they might bury themselves on the moon but have clues to get dug up and as soon as the sunlight hits them for the first time in millions of years, they send a signal out uh, saying, hey, guess who's here? Um, a, a robotic sentinel might establish contact with a developing race at a certain tech threshold. Um, radio, we've already achieved that. Space flight, we've achieved that. I have gone on radio shows like Coast to Coast and taunted the UFO guys um, saying, saying, if you want contact, just here's the phone number of the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, tell them something you'll do to the Crater Aristarchus tomorrow night. If you do it, they'll arrange everything. Visas, landing rights, passports, anything you want, we will throw a party such as no one ever was thrown before. 
And if you're refusing this and continuing to twirl wheat and kidnap farmers for anal probes, then we know what you are. You're nasty people and we're going to shoot you down. And if you like, during questions, you could get me started on this whole UAP UFO thing. Because <laughs> my blog is not called Contrary Brin for nothing. Okay, but co-orbitals are very interesting. And Gregory Benford's brother, Jim Benford, is part of a process to try to inspect these quasi moons that keep returning to the Earth. They're the closest of all the Earth crossing asteroids, and they might be perfect places for the setup of these kinds of probes. Uh, and there's even a plan to use planetary radar to scan the surface to see if there's a specular or shiny reflection of some kind of metal object. In my novel existence, um, and there's an example of some of the um, some of the things I'm talking about. The Chinese are even mentioned a, uh, a mission. This uh, you can see on the bottom the uh, the Carignier's weird orbit. Um, in my novel existence, I posit that such um, such uh, and there's the trailer, by the way. There's the URL for the trailer. Um, the, that such uh, probes may be even plentiful in the asteroid belt. And so a part of the novel takes place in the asteroid belt as we sort of in a, what I think may be a pretty good story that moves along, you nevertheless explore a dozen different motivations and different types of um, these probes. And all of them, every last one of them is obsolete because something else um, has pervaded the galaxy. Okay, so for those of you who want, you can get this. Uh, I'll even put it in the chat. I'll even put the, the, uh, the link there. Next slide. Okay, so Karinye is... Um, Closest approach to Earth is 0 0.08 AU. Um, it may have had a close encounter with Mars a while back, but there are others as well. Carinia is two to five kilometers. Um, 2016 HO3, or as some people call it, peroxide, um, is a, um, some of you, a few of you laughed just then. Um, is small and closest known, um, and it, it's easy to find. Next. Okay, so let's look at these uh, at that chart again. It's a beautiful chart. I can never find out who to who to credit it. So I've, a number of my illustrations, I'm a I'm a bad boy. A number of them are not credited. Let's move on next. As I mentioned, it turns out that. All but Jupiter have gravity very near Earth or Mars or the Moon. Um, it, and so, yeah, I, I misnamed a few of them in the wrong categories. Sorry about that. Um, but it turns out that that's, that's actually would be very, very good for us to have an orbital test, uh, gravitational test facility. And uh, NIAC has funded one, though it's, I don't think, quite as good as that of my friend, uh, Joe Carroll, who is Mr. Tether. Next slide. So we don't know in that curve in the lower right, we don't know whether you can get Earth normal health just by having uh, mild partial gravity, a tenth of a G or less, um, or if you need to go pretty much all the way to Earth gravity in order to have real health. We don't know what that curve is, so it would be a good idea to do these tests. Next. Okay, so beanstalks, beanstalks. Well, they're very hard to build for Earth for several reasons. One is that it's right up against the molecular bonds of carbon to make a, a, a beanstalk that's, that's, um, that's tall enough and strong enough. Earth may be a little bit large for uh, a water world, 
Um, now, beanstalks work really well uh, on Mars. You can make it out of steel and it's portrayed in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars series. And the moon, you can make it out of uh, the, whatever you have lying around that you can process. Uh, and I use a, a, a lunar beanstalk on the other side, on the far side of the moon to do something extremely important, though not urgent. Now, what could be spectacularly important and totally not urgent? Uh, I would normally ask for volunteers from the audience, but I'll just tell you, it's saving the earth from the fact that the sun is getting gradually hotter and will be too hot in about 100 million years. Uh, even if we get rid of the carbon dioxide and all the stupid things we're doing lately, even if we go back to the nearly transparent atmosphere that only has enough carbon dioxide for plants to live, which is what we need in order to strike a Gaia balance um, at the skating the inner edge of the solar system. Turns out it, if Mars had been the size of Earth, Mars would have water, uh, water oceans now. It just would have struck a Gaia balance with a much denser atmosphere. We'd have been able to go down and surf with the Martians, but we'd have to, have to wear respirators. Um, no, we have to, in just a hundred million years or one forty-fifth of the uh, lifespan of the earth, we have to start moving the earth um, or, or, or she's, she's toast over the next hundred million years. And it turns out that over those time scales, we can move the earth. And it's not by the insanely stupid method that everybody talks about, which is hurling comets and asteroids just past the earth to, to drag it outward. Have you ever heard anything more insane? Oh well, yeah, I'm talking to Americans after the last five years of politics. All right, have you ever heard of anything abstract and, and scientific that's more insane than hurling asteroids back past the earth in order to save it. No, I have a different method and it uses beanstalks. The next slide. Oh, and there it is. And we'll put that one in the, um, in the chat as well. Uh, I'll, I'll just put it in the chat. Uh, and there it is, lift the earth. Okay, next slide. So the gravitational lens mission is the next place because it's orders of magnitude less than going to Alpha Centauri. And yet it's fantastic science. And again, it's another of the many things that are depicted in my novel existence. And uh, at 550 AU, you start getting sunlight that's grazing past the um, sun focused along a focal line. Now it is not an easily visualized focal point. Uh, it's going to take some real co uh, computational ability and integration time, but if we can get out there, and that is a nice distance that's an or just an order of magnitude behind, beyond what we've already achieved. Um, if we can do that, and uh, there's no doubt we can, there are several NIACs that are about this, um, then uh, we could uh, look past the sun uh, and in all sorts of directions and see all sorts of things. But it turns out there is a, a goal that's an order of magnitude closer than that, more than an order of magnitude closer than that. That's absolutely fab fabulous. And that is the neutrino gravitational lens point. And that's just beyond Uranus. We could send probes that have neutrino detectors beyond Uranus, and they might suddenly flash with just lots and lots of neutrinos because that's where it gets focused uh, for neutrinos. Um, and again, you can find that in existence. All right, so um, next uh, step is slow habitat arcs. And Kim Stanley Robinson, he got sick and tired of people saying, how come you're always in, just in the solar system? Uh, go interstellar. And he said, all right, I'll go interstellar once. And he wrote this grouchy novel talking about all the ways in which humanity is never going to leave the solar system, or at least not successfully. 
Uh, I love Stan. He's a dear pal, uh, but um, there are answers to an awful lot of his objections. Uh, and he shows slow habitat arcs, arcs, and here's the point, <laughs> until the end of the book. There's a uh, suspension. Um, in other words, if we could freeze ourselves or and next, the different kinds of probes. And among those probes, it's been hypothesized, send von Neumann self-replicating probes that stay loyal to us and mine asteroids for resources and then make humans and make them not just humans that were in their vats, maybe even with memories, but make them modify to fit well into the biospheres that, that have been discovered in the solar system. Next uh, slide. So I've spoken of all three of these. Starshot is trying to do beam propulsion. I need to hurry along here because I promised to keep it to an hour. Next. Okay, the Goldilocks zone is very complicated. It turns out that the hotter the star, and, and our sun is actually, it's called dwarf, but it's actually way larger than average star um, and relatively rare. Uh, I mean, not totally rare, but um, this is an older slide, but it shows where many of these objects are with regard to the Goldilocks zone and how Earth skates the inner edge of our sun's Goldilocks zone. And the tragedy of Mars was just that it was too small. But there are many, uh, there are many uh, potential abodes for life. Go on, next slide. Okay, so is there a great filter? Um, I, I mentioned the Fermi paradox. I don't have to explain it to anybody in this room. It's the question of why we don't see any sides of anybody else. There, uh, I had one of the first papers that tried to catalog. Back in 1983, in the Quarterly Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society, I cataloged 50 possible theories for what I called the Great Silence, and I still think it's a lot better um, a name than the Fermi Paradox, but I'll go along with everybody else, just like I'll go along with gender pronouns. You know, eh, I, who am I, an old fart to tell people? Uh, I won't do that. Um, but in any event, um, of the many potential explanations, you want to click and see if we get the Drake equation? We do. Uh, of the Drake equation components, the fraction with planets, F sub P, was a mystery. And now it's a no-brainer on this. Uh, especially if we include those icy roofed worlds that I spoke, ocean worlds that I spoke of earlier. But those worlds might have a small F sub L, they very likely have a very small F sub C, which is the fraction that develop uh, technological civilization. But F sub L is uh, one that gets a lot of discussion and that is the fraction that kill themselves or the fraction that live long enough to get out into the galaxy. And I think that um, F sub I, F sub C, and F sub L are the ones that I think are probably responsible. And the two that are the top um, fair being explanations in my mind are one, I believe there is substantial evidence that we got very smart very fast, so fast, that the goat herds and primitive irrigation we were using to destroy this planet uh, back in the late Neolithic and early agricultural era, and boy, we were, we were doing a number on this planet even then on low tech, that that only started about 10,000, 12,000, 13,000 years before we became truly scientific, which means we became scientific soon enough to see what we're doing ecologically, possibly in time to fix it. And other species that became intelligent more gradually, they might, before they became smart, they might inherit a ruined world. And we might be on either side of that tilting point. We may be just, especially with politics the last five years, uh, we may be just a bit too stupid 
Um, or we may be just barely smart enough. But in any event, the other one that I think is highly plausible is if you look at the male reproductive strategies of almost every mammal, it's to um, battle to prevent other men from um, reproducing, other males from reproducing and taking their females. This manifested in humanity since the discovery of agriculture in something called feudalism. And that pyramid of power dominated almost all human civilizations. It was certainly the destroyer of open free markets. Uh, Adam Smith didn't give a damn about socialism. He uh, denounced the oligarchies that uh, are cheaters for the sake of their sons, their, their useless sons. Um, and feudalism was such a strong attractor trait that 99% of our ancestors lived under it. And feudal lords have a tendency to be extraordinarily stupid. Uh, and that just explains a litany of horrors that is co sometimes called history. But humanity found another attractor state, a different state than feudalism. We've only tried it three or four times. Periclean Athens, Da Vinci's Florence, Amsterdam, Renaissance Amsterdam, and the 300 year experiment that we've been engaged in, the greatest period of progress in the history of humanity, all of the rest of generations combined. And um, it's quite possible that this enlightenment civilization is difficult and very rare in the galaxy. Certainly it's difficult now as all the world's oligarchies and mafias um, are trying, are joined together in trying to end this enlightenment experiment. Um, okay, so those are my two top Fermi paradox explanations. Be happy to discuss some of it with the rest of you at some other time. I have some links also that deal with that. Um, and I think we have one more slide or two. Oh yes, I wanna mention TASAT. TASAT is a project that I thought of while talking at the CIA and saying, what if someday you come up, you encounter some terribly dangerous and frightening and weird thing? It could be contact with aliens. It could be mole people coming out of the center of the earth. It could be the walking trees that are called triffids. Any number of possibilities you will create a commission to investigate it. And very likely that commission will make mistakes. Um, this happens, has happened thousands of times in science fiction stories and the mistakes drive the story. Wouldn't it be good to have a reservoir of um, nerds who can say to any scenario, Oh yeah, that specific scenario occurred in the 1954 astounding issue um, and, and also in a 1938 uh, Amazing Stories. Um, those nerdy geeks members of this community of TASAT or there's a story about that might someday save the world. It's a very small probability, but they might. So we're taking names. You can read a write up about TASAT uh, at this address, and uh, I have a guy who's fixing the website. The first version didn't work well. And by the way, we also are interested in volunteer super programmers to help get TASAT up and running, because when it is up and running, go ahead and read the uh, my explanation at the site for what it's all about. Um, but it's a slim possibility that science fiction geekdom could save the world. Okay, uh, next slide. Oh, and it's sponsored by the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UCSD, which I helped to establish. Which all leads to the question, if we're first, maybe we can light up the galaxy. It's the best of all possible outcomes for humanity for us to become the ancient ones. And by the way, I have a novel called The Ancient Ones. And I'll even put that in the chat too. So uh, I guess, unless there's any more slides, I guess we do have time for questions. I kept my promise. I'm, I'm putting 
the various there we go that I promised to put up uh, squeeze behind you. Up on the chat. Uh, the bottom one is image. The bottom one is the existence um, three minute video trailer that I promised is the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Uh, and of course, my own website, uh, you can see all the different things I've been writing lately. I've come out with uh, eight books in the last year, none of them the main novel that you're waiting for. Sorry, but I do have a sci fi comedy and you're welcome to read the first three chapters for free online or any of my YA series. I have two YA series, series for young adults, adventure stories. Um, in one of them, aliens kidnap a California high school and live to regret it. Okay, question. All right, I'm, I'm juggling uh, cards here. Um, okay, I'll, I'll throw you a softball to start with. Uh, do you not consider the moon a good and viable testing ground for testing habitats and technology that can be used for future missions to Mars and beyond? Um, sorta, sorta. I think Gateway is better because we need to test the ships that are going to go to Mars before we need to test those habitats. Uh, look, I'm not totally opposed to American astronauts going to Mars. What I oppose is a race to get there and say, <laughs> we have to beat the Chinese. That's crazy. We did that. There are no symbolic reasons for America to go to the moon. We should go there deliberately and, and, and in all preceded by everything that can be done by robots and explore those those lava tubes because they're the best places to make lunar habitats. Uh, I'm not unalterably against American astronaut footprints on the moon, but we've been there, we've done that, we don't need a bar moonsva. The, the, the real work of figuring out how to do these things is going to be robotic, but let's do the commercial space station in low earth orbit learn a lot from that. And let's do Gateway as a way to test the um, ships. Let's find out where the water ice is on the moon, on Mars and, and God willing on Phobos. And let's, let's figure out how to do ISRU, uh, how to gather these resources, which will be mostly robotically. But um, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that do not accept magical incantations as being true just because they sound good. We've had five years of that from one of our political parties and we have, and, 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 and this whole business, vast lunar resources. Show me, show me those vast lunar resources. It ain't true except in the very limited sense that it might be true about lunar ice. I'm, I'm going to take moderator privilege to follow up on that question. Um, if, if we postulate that a lunar gateway is a useful asset for the United States, um, there's been a lot of debate about where to put it. Uh, near rectilinear orbits, uh, distant retrograde orbits, L1, L2, so forth. Do, do you have an opinion on where the right place to put it is? Well, you know, I've been terribly impressed. Uh, Trump's probably one of only three really good appointees he made was Bridenstine. He absolutely shocked everybody. He was curious. He was respectful, but 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 intensely interrogating of his scientists. And um, the result was he managed to save most of the technology programs from being gobbled up by Artemis. And Gateway is still a viable thing. And the, lunar, the rectilinear orbit is the current plan because it stays in daylight almost all the time. Um, and that's valuable for a entirely solar powered uh, space station. Um, I'm not going to, and especially one that is going to largely service landers that are going to the poles. Now you pick a pole, but if it, if it has its peri-lune um, over the, the South Pole, 
Well, you know, the, your hotel guests and lander refurb, uh, refurbished landers are going to have a fairly easy time coming and going uh, from that South Pole area. Fair, fair enough. Uh, a different question. I'm going to try to rephrase this to be a little more clear. Um, if, if you were to devise your last thought before dying, what would it be in a hundred words or less? Well, it would be, um, be uh, I suppose, game over, reset. <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, a reset back to last milestone. <laughs> uh, what was what are they called in games these days? Um, it's not a milestone. It's one of you is young enough to know. You know, back to your last last um, saved life. No, I I don't believe in in raging raging against the dying of the light. Um, if it ends, it ends, and I've done some good things. It turns out that I probably did the best thing I ever did in my life when I was 19 years old. And I only really realized it about six or seven years ago when I looked back at the Life magazine centerfold that showed uh, me in the lower left-hand corner uh, helping to organize the clean air car race of 1970 that was covered every night on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. And uh, it had the world's first hybrid car that led eventually, 25 years later, to the Prius. That took a long time. But... Within six months of the race, the bill was out of committee to end leaded gas in America. And uh, the lead that we boomers inhaled is probably the explanation for those last uh, five years of insanity. Um, but the subsequent generations have absorbed a lot less lead and that may have been the most important thing I ever did. That's an interesting perspective, that's cool, that's cool. Um, another extreme, um, what mechanism are you proposing to lift the earth? Okay, I, I put the thing there, uh, I put the link there. I have a cool video, large fun that Scott Manley referred to in one of his, um, in one of his uh, YouTubes, you know, I am flattered. Isaac Arthur ever also said something nice about me. So, wow, stars. Um, but it's basically you put out a, um, a, a big beanstalk at the, uh, by the way, you can put my face on the screen now, uh, a big, you're up, you, you've been up for a while. Oh, okay, great. Um, a big beanstalk on the other side of the moon. And if you pump enough electricity through one of these conducting beanstalks, you create an electromotive force and all it takes through a tether on the other side of the moon. And you have to pump only during two weeks of the lunar orbit. If you pump the other times, you'll take the moon away from the earth. But if you pump at the right times in the lunar orbit, instead you turn the moon into a tug and it will tug the earth gradually outward by accelerating its transverse uh, orbital momentum. Um, and all you have to do is pump enough electricity through that cable to be the equivalent of 30 or 40 times the total amount of electricity used by our civilization today. Now, now that's... that's for, for how long? Oh, well, you're going to have to uh, have a duty cycle of at least a quarter of the time across the next hundred million years. <laughs> so civilizations are going to rise and fall and you leave obelisks saying, all right, we promised to do this. We, we, we put in a good 2 million years of tugging, you know, here's how to do it. You'll find the factories on the far side of the moon to build the tether again. Um, okay. Okay. You rodents, you cockroaches, your turn. <laughs> but we did our share. And unlike all the other geoengineering solutions to the warning, like putting sun shields up, if this one fails and the tether gets snipped, it just floats away. All of the good you've done by pulling the earth out is still retained. So it's a ratchet effect 
Uh, and it's a great way to go visit Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I, I, I can't I point the directional mic at these guys if they're laughing because that's my food. Uh, okay, so um, another question. Um, unless there's more being written that I don't see, I've got the last one here. Um, when can we donate collections of science fiction stories to TASAT or TASAT, how do you pronounce it? Oh, well, you don't donate the stories. What you do is you join and then you get alerts by email saying, here's a scenario. And mostly the scenarios are going to be offered by other TASAT members or just members of the public. And we'll need some people to volunteers to be part of an ongoing committee to throw away the trash and the spam. But basically, um, are there any science fiction stories about mole people, you know, who, uh, who resent our trash? Well, then just the nerds who are members of the community, all they have to do is answer that email. Yeah, the 1954 Astounding Magazine, you know. And you may not know if one of those questions comes from a desperate um, government agency. You may never know. Um, but better they should have our sci-fi than not. And it, that's really what it comes down to. So if you go to the TASAT site and sign up, if you can't, then there's a glitch in the system and just set aside the, the, the uh, URL and remind yourself six months from now. If you're, a, if you're really a great programming geek, get in touch with me um, and I'll, uh, I'll, we'll make good use of you. Uh, otherwise, if you're just a sci-fi nerd, uh, then just leave your name and address and someday you'll start getting uh, alerts. That's cool. I, and not, not from an area of, of threats, of, of you know, things that are scary, but uh, I've noticed that uh, you know, anybody talking publicly about uh, you know, artificial uh, uh, you know, uter uterine replicators for you know, bringing near-term pregnancy or low-term pregnancies to term, they should just read Lois McMaster Bujold. I mean, she, she thought all this stuff through 20 years ago. And, you know, I, I read public policy debates and it's like, you should go read these books first. So it's, it's uh, I totally agree that one of the things we're, we aim to do is to get policymakers addicted to sci-fi, um, to consulting this so that they'll read more. Yeah. Um, and and that's, um, that's a, a nice, well, who knows? You know, maybe when TASAT gets running, it will replace the clean air car race as the most important thing. That's, um, that's a cool ambition. That's very cool. Um, I'm the point I keep taking my glasses off to read these things. Uh, we do have one more. Um, uh, what is the proof you mentioned that we humans became smart quite fast? Oh, well, it's right there in the, in the rocks. Um, and I talk about this also in my novel Existence. It's packed with stuff. And that is that about 45,000 years ago, um, humanity experienced uh, the first of at least two dozen major um, operating system upgrades. And the thing that we evolved was probably the ability to do operating system upgrades. And the Neanderthals may not have had that, and that may have been to their detriment. Um, in any event, about 45,000 years ago, there was a huge sudden expansion of our toolkit and making sewn clothes and the arts and the caves and all that sort of thing and the death of the Neanderthals. Um, and um, these, these technological breakthroughs started accelerating and they came faster and then faster and then faster. One came about 14, 15,000 years ago with agriculture and then um, uh, the societies larger than tribes, which allowed there to become what I talked about before, feudalism and kings and beer. And this sudden arrival of both beer and kings, in my opinion, is the explanation for what's called the great Y chromosome winnowing. Because about 12,000 <laughs> about 12, years ago, um, most of the men did not reproduce for several hundred years. It was just a few men who reproduced. And if you look at the records of the Polynesians, uh, the way the Polynesian kings ruled, 
when uh, they were first contacted, if that was the model for how the early kingdoms worked, then the king would simply point at somebody and say, um, kill him, then send me his women. Um, and what would cause somebody to irritate a king enough to say that? Beer. <laughs> and that is probably why um, humans are among the mammals who are most capable of saying no to addiction. Um, now, now, we have terrible problems because of the residual ability to become addicted. And the worst of our problems that may keep us from the galaxy is an, an addiction that we're not proof against, and it's called um, self-righteousness. Um, all of us are capable of being deeply, deeply um, uh, addicted to self-righteous sanctimony. Uh, and it's poisoning the rational ability of a fact, practical, fact-centered nation to continue leading the world. And I will include in the chat uh, a link to that one, because I have a talk about that. Uh, is that close to it? We're, we're at time. I'm, I'm again going to uh, exercise moderator's privilege to, to ask one last question. Uh, when I moved from Atlanta to Tucson, uh, I had about 7,000 hardback books that I couldn't afford to move. Uh, and my wife in the corner there let me bring 400. Uh, yours made the cut. Uh, one of them was a book called Earth. Uh, and there are now websites devoted to all of the predictions you made in Earth uh, and how prescient that was. Um, what are your thoughts on being seen as somebody who, you know, 30 years ago figured out a lot of what we're dealing with today? Well, first, it makes me sad because I am just famous enough and just influential enough to give talks at CIA and stuff like that, and not enough to be listened to. <laughs> uh, for example, I'm going to um, put in the chat my a political book that I spent last autumn writing and self-publishing to rush out in time for the election. Didn't get a single review anywhere. Uh, no politician of any stripe has looked at it, but it's there in the chat. Um, it's, it's actually uh, extremely frustrating place to be. Uh, I feel very often like a Cassandra. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I remember all my past lives and I had this same personality and I was murdered by the time I was 16. <laughs> so this is the first time I was allowed to reach 70 and have children and be respected uh, for my blather and my ego. And so, um, yeah, ha as Dirty Harry said at the end of the wisest movie, uh, Magnum Force, a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> It, it beats the Godfather for its range of wise statements. <laughs> All right. I, th I think we'll, we're, we're, we're well past nine o'clock. I think we'll call that it. David, I'm sorry you couldn't come to Tucson. Uh, the weather's glorious. Uh, we'd love to have you here. Uh, oh, I have yeah. great news. I have great news. Um, Nyack is coming to, to Tucson September 20th, 2022. Yes, Nyack will be here next year, COVID permitting. Uh, the Interstellar Research Group will not be here next year, uh, but we will be meeting in 2023 and we'll try to get you there. We'll, we'll be announcing that soon. So anyhow, All right. with, with, with that, David, thank you so much for this. Ernie, thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it. Uh, and every, everything that he said is in the chat. Uh, we will uh, record that on that machine back there and we'll get it to everybody by some mechanism. Watch your email. Oh, so and, we'll, it, we'll and if you're there. disappointed that you didn't have the book signing, uh, Stephen, um, uh, contact me with your address. I'll send a bunch of book plates. Yeah, we uh, we're, we actually are gonna we were gonna have a signing. Uh, we're gonna do some book plates. So for the, those of you who who kept your hardback books, we'll get book plates to you. Oh, well, that's David, right. I, I sent some. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Th th thank you so much, people. We appreciate it. Thank you. So David, let you go. Thanks. Good night. Take care.